Thomas um, made it up here just in time. The original intention was to have that first song playing before the start of worship or while people were filing in, um, but it hasn't really turned out that way. So I uh, had a few things to arrange this morning. So it is good to spend an hour resting in the presence of the Lord. It's good to spend an hour in each other's company. And it's good to spend an hour opening our hearts and minds to the Holy Spirit. Let us do so in this hour. Does anyone have any announcements? Joy. The mission and outreach team is out in our evening meeting uh, this Thursday at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Anybody's welcome. You don't have to be a member. Anybody that believes in being a Christian, you're welcome. Well, then we should have quite a crowd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Denise. Ed Castle, Joan Owen, and Tiny Luke would like to thank everyone for all their prayers and for all the cards that they received. So well, right. Thank you to everybody. Yes, thank you to everyone. Yes, Joy. Um, that card that was sent out to uh, Judy, I got a uh, card back from my birthday to go around and um, go ahead and read that. But it's going through more unfortunate health um, problems. And then I did get a card for Tom. Okay, good. Anyone else? Does anyone know if I have any announcements? <laughs> um, oh, one, I've already talked to most of the people who, who go to the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, and uh, some of the people who used to go to that are going to the Tuesday Bible study now. So uh, we're considering um, just asking everyone to come on Tuesday. Um, it's been kind of low attendance, so I think that would be a wise move. Um, but I'm not making that move just yet. Uh, but uh, I do encourage everyone to participate in a Bible study of some kind. Um, so uh, you can jump in at any time. Uh, lots of people do. And it helps us to grow and helps us to grow together closer to one another. And there may be some people you're like, no, I don't want to be, but um, you'll have to tolerate me in that. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, the Wednesday Bible study may just get folded into the Tuesday Bible study. Any other, no other announcements? Then let us open our worship with a word of prayer. Good and glorious God, the God of life, the God of hope, the God of love. We gather this morning to praise you, to honor you, to have our lives touched by you and by your word. We thank you for this day and we thank you for this fellowship of people, this fellowship of love. Help us, Lord, live into that love, that our lives might be fully complete. In Jesus' name, amen. And now our opening hymn will be Because He Lives, which is number 364. Thank you. 
Life indeed can be hectic, and sometimes we can feel like we're running back and forth and getting nowhere. But God's gift to us is that all that we give to God is blessed by His grace, amplified by His power, and sent to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So as we give our offerings this morning, let us give thanks to God for what he can do with not just our offering, which is mainly used to pay the bills, but with how we offer our lives to God, how we serve one another in our world, how we pray, and how we love. These are the greatest gifts that we can give to God. Ushers, please come forward. especially the gift of life itself. May our offerings help others to find true life, life in Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And this week, I am not forgetting the prayer of the people. So, not having forgotten it, let us share with one another those concerns that are on our hearts, those things that weigh on our minds, and those burdens that we and those around us carry. But let us also share with one another the life-giving love that helps each other to bear the burden, that helps each other to find life, and to help each other find comfort. Does anyone have anything this morning? Joy. Please say additional prayers for Jeffrey as he was down in Florida. His head came out and had to have additional surgery to put back in. Mm -hmm. For this time, obviously, a second phase of recovery to go as quickly as his first. And his prayer is even. We will pray for Jeffrey. Or anyone else? Here. 
I did get a nice note from Ed. I was going to bring it, and I forgot. Um, he sent it to me with his offering. He said he's doing well, and he sent everybody his love. And we will keep praying for Ed. Um, and uh, even we're still jealous of him for it. But uh, Rita. Yes, we'd like to ask for prayers for Ellen Hunky. She's going to be going through some surgery this week. What day is her surgery? Tuesday. I think, Tuesday. 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 Keep Ellen in our prayers. Mike. I have a joy. I have a new great nephew, Bennett Ray Hagen, seven pounds, seven ounces, and he was born my uh, mom and the baby are going good. Praise God. Anyone else? Bill. I have a friend who worked for Noble. He's applying to uh, the uh, Westville Trojan just so he can be a chaplain. So he's having a meeting with the warden on the May 3rd. So just pray for him to get in there as a chaplain. All right, prayers for Virgil that uh, God paved the way for him. Anyone else? All right, if not, let us take all of these concerns and the other things in our hearts to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, your love is so much beyond what we can comprehend. And yet we trust and have faith in that love, that love that gives life, the love that heals, the love that comforts. And we also remember that that same love calls us to serve one another, to care for one another, and to reflect your love into the world. May our words always reflect your love. May our actions and deeds always be motivated by your love. And may our hearts and minds hold on to your love as the source of life for us all. Help us, Lord, to oppose all of those things which would diminish life, which would diminish love. And help us, Lord, to have forgiving hearts, even as you forgive us. We know, Lord, that we fall short of all that you intend for us. But we give you thanks, Lord, for the grace that covers all. The grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, who walked on this world, healing, giving sight to the blind, enabling the lame to walk, cleansing the leper. Cleanse us of our spots, O Lord. Open our eyes that we might see, and give us hands and feet that are able to serve you in the ways that you call us. We thank you especially, Lord, for your victory over death in Jesus Christ the first fruit, the promise of what you have in store for all of those who believe. And so we join with the risen and living Lord and pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as Rita comes forward to share with us the scriptures, let us open our minds and our hearts to hear the word of the Lord and the words of uh, First Corinthians. Christ has been raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, 
then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we have been found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Rita. Please pray with me. This morning, Lord, show us the way. Give us hope. Strengthen our faith. And help us to live out your word more faithfully. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'm going to confess. I didn't know what to preach about this passage. I mean, does anybody here doubt that Jesus was raised from the dead? Nobody. Does anybody doubt that you will be raised from the dead? All right, so we're done. I don't need to preach anything, right? <laughs> Obviously, I'm still going to preach something. We've been talking for the last several weeks about the situation in the church in Corinth. The conflicts and the arguments, the broken relationships that were the thing that Paul was addressing in his, this letter to the church in Corinth. And we've heard about um, disagreements over how you practice communion. And we haven't talked about that a whole lot, but they disagreed in all sorts of ways. And part of the reason for the disagreement is that they were a very diverse congregation. You had wealthy and poor. You had Greeks and Romans and probably some, some Jews and people from all sorts of other lands. Because Corinth was a huge city with people from all over who went there because of the economic opportunity or they were sent there by their masters to do their bidding. And one of the things about the Roman world, especially in the Greek part of the Roman world, which is where Corinth is, is that they had a whole history of a belief in the gods of Greece and Rome. And they had a whole religion and culture built up around that that was distinct from the religion of the Hebrews who believed in one God. And even when you come to believe in Jesus, all of that cultural stuff it comes along with you. And so for many of the people in the church in Corinth, they had been raised, and their grandma had taught them that when you die, your eternal soul will go up to be with the gods. Now, does that sound very different from what we believe? Well, maybe not on the surface. But for Paul, there was a distinct difference. And the difference wasn't in just the details about what you believe, but in how what you believe affects how you live your life and how you relate to other people. Because you see, this Greco-Roman idea of an eternal soul denied the importance of the body. In fact, they thought of the body as mere clay, almost as if it were just dust and ashes. But that's what the Hebrews said. So what's the difference? The difference is that in Jesus Christ, God raised him bodily from the grave. 
And that makes all the difference in the world. And what was happening to the people in Corinth is their belief in only a sort of spiritual freeing of some eternal soul was that meant that the things of the body in this world didn't matter very much. That it didn't matter what you did with your body so long as your soul was secure. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, and indeed the entire witness of the Old Testament, is that it's not just our spiritual state, but it's also important what we do with our bodies. And I'm not talking about eating your five a day of fruits and vegetables, though that's part of it. I'm talking about how do we use these bodies to show the love of God to other people. And we know from the book of Corinthians that the people of Corinth, the church in Corinth, was struggling with how they used their bodies to show God's love to one another. We skipped over Paul's chapter about communion. But it's a great example because what would happen in communion is, and at that time communion was a full meal, is the people of wealth and means who didn't have to work, they could show up and eat all the food and drink all the wine while the working class stiffs who came after they got off of their job showed up and there was nothing left for them. Now, if it was only a spiritual matter, well, you know, your, your spirit's fine. You believe in Jesus. You don't need to eat and drink with us. But if bodies matter, then how we treat one another, do we take the time, do we make the sacrifice to wait until everybody can be gathered? Do we save food for those who couldn't be there. The spirit is not disconnected from the body, but the spirit moves through the body. And how we treat our body and use our bodies to serve others, it indicates the state of that spirit. And so Paul makes this argument that if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, which actually, looking at his argument, that's not in question for the people of Corinth. In fact, people in Greece and Rome believed that occasionally, particularly saintly people would be raised from the dead. They didn't consider that unusual. What they considered unusual had a hard time accepting, perhaps, was that they and you and I could receive the same blessing as a person of exceptional holiness. And that's really kind of the crux of Paul's argument. Because yes, Jesus was of exceptional holiness. He was the Son of God. But what Jesus did is to incorporate us into the family of God. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then that means that all of his followers will be also. But if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then nothing matters. Eat, drink, and be merry. Treat each other like garbage. Take advantage of one another. All of those ways that love may or may not be lived out in the real world, all stem from the belief that you, the belief that your enemy, is a beloved creation of God. And that everything that God created is meant by God to be redeemed. Everything that God created is meant to be 
ED. It is meant to have life. And that includes this body. Now, if we were to have read the next chapter, 1 Corinthians, but next week we're switching over to Luke, so we won't get there. Paul goes on to say, is it going to be exactly this body? No. And Paul says, and I don't know what it's going to be. <coughs> it's not the details that matter. It's how the belief in the resurrection of the body gathers a community of people that take each other's bodies as holy. And if our bodies are holy, and if your bodies are holy, then we don't abuse them. We don't diminish your importance. We don't take advantage of each other. Right belief isn't important for being right. Right belief is important because it guides how we live our lives. Jesus Christ took bodies, human bodies, seriously. So seriously that when you see somebody who is suffering, whether it was a demon possession, leprosy, blindness, lameness, Jesus wanted them to be whole. When we see people who are not whole, who are broken, if we believe in the resurrection of the body, then we must help make that person whole. We may not have the gift of healing that can rub some spit in somebody's eyes and give them sight. But we do all have the gift of healing. Of making a broken spirit whole by sharing with them the love of Christ. For those who cannot see the truth we can open their eyes by proclaiming the gospel of Christ. For those who are outcast and not included, we can separate ourselves from the crowd and go to make the lonely person feel less lonely. In Christianity today, people believe different things about the resurrection. <clears throat> there are <is> some, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some Protestants, friends of mine, who absolutely believe that the biblical witness is that when you die, you are dead in the grave, asleep, perhaps, as Paul says, until the day of resurrection. And there are others who believe that when you die, your soul goes to be with God, and this body rots, and at some point in the future, there will be some kind of resurrection. And there are some people like me who think it's kind of both. My personal belief is that when we die, our soul does go in heaven to be with God, to be reunited with our resurrected body on the day of judgment. It doesn't matter how we believe it works. Because the truth is, none of us know. And in the next chapter, as I said, Paul will say, and how it works, I don't know. But it's important to believe that it works. It is important to believe, as the Apostles' Creed says, in the resurrection of the body. I'm convinced that it will be a different kind of body. I'm convinced that it will be like Jesus who his resurrected body was confusing. He could appear in a locked room as if he were pure spirit and a ghost. And yet he ate and Thomas touched his flesh. The rules are beyond our understanding. But bodies matter. 
in a lot of modern thinking, especially outside of the church, I've heard people say things like, I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience, which may be true in a way, but the biblical witnesses that our bodies, our souls, our spirits are one. Just like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. We aren't two distinct parts. And when we think that we are two distinct parts, the body becomes devalued. But God has put great value upon your whole self. Body, mind, soul, spirit. And these aren't separate parts. These are one unified whole. And it matters because it's lived out in the way we live in the world. And if we see people who are broken, perhaps what broken means is to have people whose mind thinks one thing, soul is in a different state, they're doing a different thing with their body. They're living a disjointed and disconnected life. But in Jesus Christ, our minds, our spirits, our souls, our bodies serve one risen Lord and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in union with what Christ offered for us. And that's part of what we say every time we have communion. And we say, even though we are many, just like the one loaf, we are one body. And that body matters also. Not just our individual body, but our oneness in the body of Christ. And as a church, if we take that body seriously, that body will serve the Lord in fruitfulness and effectiveness. And we do that. I don't want to imply that we don't do enough. But I do want to say that, like almost every church, an awful lot of our energy and focus is spent on maintaining ourselves. That perhaps we could afford to sacrifice some of that attention on taking care of our beautiful facility and taking care of each other and recognize that there are people out there that are broken off from the body. People that God created. People that God wants to redeem. And that we can use this body to be more assertive in reaching out into the world to make the broken whole to incorporate them into our community of faith, to show them the love of God that we have experienced and our own salvation and our own experience of being broken and made whole. So this week, as we live the call, let the love of God, let the risen Christ fill all that you do with your body and how you interact with other bodies, all because of the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let us now give thanks to our Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. To give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You know the minds and hearts of your faithful people. Blessed are those who put their trust in you. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He shared the secrets of the kingdom, blessed the poor, fed the hungry, healed the broken heart. He brought judgment upon the wicked, and for that he was killed. But he was given life again, Lord, by the power of your Spirit. 
pour out that same Holy Spirit on us and fill us with your breath that we may truly live now and forevermore. Search our minds and try our hearts that in all things we are ever faithful to you, that we are ever seeking to bring life to the lifeless, hope to the hopeless, and incorporating the separate and alone into your holy family. So Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now to share with us a story of love, that Bass Howards are going to come forward, nervously, trepidatiously. I was really excited. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So the missions uh, team has asked us, let me tell you the wording that they had, <laughs> to, for us to share so that you can learn about our relationship and how we cherish, cherish each other. So uh, Paul and I have been together for seven, well, we've been married for 17 years. We've been together for 22? <laughs> Something close to that. <laughs> um, we actually met at Ball State. We lived in the same dorm. Uh, there, on each floor there was one triple and we both happened to live in the triple and my roommates and I had our room set up kind of in a different way and so one of the girls on our floor told him and his roommates that they should come see how we had set up our triple. So him and his roommates showed up at our door one day and I guess the rest of the sister. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we met. Um, the next question was what characteristics drew you um, to each other. I would say he was really easy to talk to. Um, he was also funny, like I get his sense of humor. Oh, I like him. Um, <laughs> my roommate here was, uh, is he like to talk to me all the time? So, <laughs> and he's got a cute little smile, so. <laughs> okay, and then um, one word and how we've endured the years, we decided that word would be patience. <laughs> I think with each other and just with life in general, um, characteristics we have in common, we really do have the same sense of humor. Um, we share our responsibilities for everything. Like at our house, we don't have like your typical guy jobs and girl jobs. Like Paul does a lot of the cooking because we're all happier when he does. Um, you'll see me out in the yard a lot because I enjoy doing that. So um, I think that we just kind of take on whatever we need to do. Um, and then we also just enjoy spending tons of time together. I don't know if you know, but Paul works from home and I'm a stay at home mom. So we have ridiculous amounts of time together. Our kids don't understand it. <laughs> like I've had to explain to them when they were little, if Paul had to go somewhere for work, they would complain. I'm like, you don't understand that not all kids come home every day to everybody being home. Um, so. That's something we have in common, I guess, that we can put up with each other that much. Um, and then things that we're complete opposites in. I'm the what if person. Like, if something's going wrong, I think of every what if, and I talk about it because I'm the big talker. And Paul's always like, let's just worry about when it happens. Like, why do we need to think about all this? So we're very different in that way. And then he, I talk to everybody all the time, <laughs> as you probably know. And he's not probably going to talk a whole lot until he gets to know you. Um, and then our biggest, the first one we came up with was how we're complete opposites is, of course, our height. So <laughs> that's our story. Thank you, Paul. I had uh, actually never noticed the height difference. I was that out. <laughs> so let us now um, rise and sing our closing hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
created life. God breathed his spirit into that physical creation. Let us live in the world filled with that spirit and seeking to help others inhale deep from the breath of God. So go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and be the body of Christ. Amen. Have a blessed week.